Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. I had to take a day break yesterday to celebrate my brother Jason's birthday. Yeah, we had a fun time, you know, with the family. So everything was going great. So anyway, I'm going to continue with This is America, Charlie Brown, the Peanuts special miniseries with episode 5 that aired on February 10th, 1989. Just took a hiatus break for like a few months after the first four episodes starting with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. It's a story where Charlie Brown discusses how the two railroads Central Pacific and Union Pacific yeah, the tortoise and the hare as they're dubbed are trying to find a link to create the Transcontinental Railroad to move on within a couple miles so they'll meet with each other. <laughs> it stars Aaron Chase as Charlie Brown, Brennan Stewart as Linus Van Pilt, Curtis Anderson as Schroeder, Greg Berger as Schilling, Bill Melendez as Snoopy and Woodstock along with Spike, yeah, Snoopy's brother, and also brought in the Winnins, yeah, they're the vocalists uh, who sing the, the songs uh, for this special episode. It's created by Charles M. Schultz, along with all the other producers, Lee Mendelson and Bill Melendez. And it's directed by Sam Nicholson. The episode begins when Charlie Brown tells a story where in April... 1866, just after the Civil War ended, the Americans had struggled to put the country back in its place. The hope for unity was to build transcontinental railroads. The Federal Commission had offered two companies, the Union Pacific Railroad and the Central Pacific Railroad, to construct them through plains and opposing mountains. And the Federal Government had paid a loan subsidy to each railroad from 16,000 to 48,000 for each mile of a track. So at this rate, the Central Pacific was the tortoise and the Union Pacific is the hare. Yeah. Because the Central Pacific runs a lot slowly than Union Pacific, which actually runs very fast per mile. Anyway, a difficulty for the trains had been covered, so they offered huge land grants that would be given to each railroad for $10 million, and they were at stake. Building railroads for the Central Pacific and Sacramento, California was a lifelong dream for engineer Theodore Judah. In 1881, Judah had convinced four Sacramento merchants to invest and create the Central Pacific. For the first few years, the progress had been painfully slow across the foothills of Sierra Nevada. The workers were often quit working to discover gold and silver, so they offered youngsters to assist them. By the spring of 1886, the Central Pacific only got 68 miles from Sacramento, whereas the Union Pacific was building Westwood from Omaha, Nebraska, working over flat plans have built over 200 miles of a track in less than a year with millions more than the Central Pacific. They employed over 10,000 workers including Civil War veterans, former slaves, immigrants from Ireland and Germany, and even cowboys from the Southwest. Yeah, that's right. But dangerous times lies ahead for the crews of both railroads. In fact, for the next three years, two railroads had constructed them for about 1,800 miles across rivers, deserts, and mountains. Between the blazing heats of summer and the blinding blizzards of winter, the most impossible of them of all will be the solid granite of the Sierra Nevada staring down at the workers of the Central Pacific 
the success or failures of the construction of the railroads in American history will determine to be the futures of the United States for decades to come. Between the competition of the Union Pacific and Central Pacific, if successful, they will not only unite the country, but will also reduce the time of nationwide travel by months. The Union Pacific started by flat land on the plains of Nebraska, getting supplies from the neighboring states, while Central Pacific had to ship every rail and spike as well as the locomotive parts for only 15 miles of parts. Since every mile of track needs eight flat cars of material, but supply problem, however, was a mess. Therefore, they hired Chinese workers to build several tracks and with anvils and picks for the trains to go with from these miles. They were so successful that they even brought more of them from China. And they continued to construct them, considering that they're actually skinny, tall, that they actually had to work very hard on the mountains, such as putting the dynamite on the cliff when they had to lower themselves down to the basket. But they had to move away from the blast. They also had similar methods of construction where they had the surveyors to map out the easiest routes of the railroad, which they had to try to find a way to, to build a tunnel to see where the train can go straight through or around the mountain. Which, that was pretty difficult at that point. <laughs> so, the graders had to cut through the gorges, you know, they had to use dynamite to blast them. On top of that, they had to grate the rope beds, build some trestles and bridges by using picks and shovels, while some of them had to be moved by wheelbarrows of horses or ponies on all on all these wagons. Once the road bed was wetty, the rails were being laid for one to one and a half feet apart from each other. Each rail was 30 feet long and weighed over 500 pounds. There were 28 tons per rail. Four people had to unload each rail from a horse, sometimes even more than four, and they had to carry the rail to the end of the track where the wooden rail ties are weighted. So there are only 2,500 ties per mile of a track where four spikes are driven in each railroad tie or about 40 spikes for each rail which became an anvil course throughout the Sierra Mountains and the plains of Nebraska. By winter of 1886, the Central Pacific had ran 95 miles from Sacramento and Union Pacific had ran by 300 miles of Omaha. Many Americans will believe that it's impossible of railroads to run by ocean to ocean would now become possible to join. So, nearly thousands of workers are now employed by these companies with small towns and other places to go on as the journey is set from years to come. Raging through rivers, the graders from both railroads, on the tunnels as they try to break through the ice with their hammers, you know, during the winter storm or even avalanche around. But then when the two railroads had finally competed tracks within 50 miles to meet in Promontory, Utah on May 10th, 1869, California Governor Leland Stanford had brought his railroad there with many guests to celebrate the last rails to be completed 
and offers him or the mayor to hit a golden spike with many reporters, workers, and others arrive in this significant event that would become the nation of the transcontinental railroad from sea to shining sea. This was a very interesting story about the transcontinental railroad right there. How it took the time and effort to have both of them compete with each other. So, <laughs> so think of it this way. I mean, you never know how they're going to land all the way or how they're going to move within miles. But yeah, they took their time and effort to do so. Um, the only disappointing task, though, was that when they finally took the, the photograph at the end of the event, that they didn't show the Chinese workers, which, yeah, which I think that was a shame because... I guess they were going for the negative side right there, which because they did all the work. They they really did need to show a lot of compassion. Yeah. But it had to have been one of the the most dangerous tasks that they had to take to build these railroads uh, from the mountains to the sea to all the other lands out there in the plains. It's just really amazing how they had to struggle. Yeah, in fact, I think some of them may have gotten killed when they did this. But hey, in, in the end, they worked so hard. I, mean, I think working on the bridge was probably the toughest of them all, as opposed to the mountains. Because they're trying to find a way to go straight out to it. I mean, we had to go by miles by miles, track by track. Yeah. Anyway, um, they had some good moments um, in the special. Like, for example, when we saw um, Snoopy's brother Spike you know, joining in. You know, he, he wants to becoming <laughs> a new harmonica player when he went inside the saloon with Schroeder playing the organ piano. And I thought that was really, <laughs> really neat because they were playing with, with a crowd of cowboys out there. Unfortunately, he went out of control and got kicked out by the cowboys. <laughs> yeah. That was an amazing scene. Or even the scenes where Charlie Brown, Linus, as well as Snoopy and were working on, on the tracks hitting the anvils uh, along with the Chinese workers and the Chinese kids and even the cowboys too and everyone it's like it really works and of course the the, the music by the wind Nins, I mean they did a great job uh, singing in the vocals of all the songs such as I've been working on the railroad and and all the other songs that involves uh, trains and everything so it just really works it's the perfect railway for, for transcontinental railroads. So that way they can go straight or between the other states or any other. You know, so they can travel along with all the supplies and, and many passengers going around. So they go from state to state everywhere they go to go on these trains. Yeah, but man, <laughs> it's just amazing. It really is. I mean, going on trains is just, it's definitely fun. But railroad construction is, is the toughest of them all. <laughs> but nevertheless. Anyway, uh, highly recommend the special. Well, anyway, it's a it's a great episode. I uh, really enjoyed it. So it really works. So I'm gonna continue with episode six of This Is America, Charlie Brown, this the Peanut Special Mini Series on my next review. So anyway, I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.